Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Call It In The Ring, a wrestling discussion with Marcus Stewart. And things are about to get extreme because we are talking about WWE Extreme Rules 2018. It is currently Monday morning. I have a coffee in one hand. I've got a kendo stick in the other hand. I'm going to use it to try to hit Nia Jax, but she's going to take it and break it in half because that thing's made out of a... Uh, toothpicks or something or she's just really strong i don't know who cares but yeah extreme rules um if you're not familiar with extreme rules the idea of this pay-per-view is that um most every match allegedly is supposed to be contested under either extreme rules which is basically a hardcore match where you can use weapons and there's no rules or it just has to have some sort of stipulation or at least wwe has kind of extended that theme to uh, as long as it has a gimmick it's quote-unquote extreme um however this year they were slacking on that big time because it was a 10 match card um i think that also includes the two matches on the pre-show or maybe not actually it might have been 12 um but regardless and only a i think less like maybe at most five of them had any kind of stipulation because we had an iron man match which is not really extreme um, the shark cage match, which again is also not extreme, uh, the tables match, which was on the pre-show, so it technically doesn't count, um, we also had the, uh, cage match, the normal steel cage match, which that, that's an extreme stipulation, and then we had an actual, one actual extreme rules match, um, which is kind of ridiculous, given that, you know, what, like I just said, the entire theme of the show is supposed to be extreme, Hold on, let me take a quick sip of coffee. Mmm. Ah, delicious. Like I said, it's um, it's still early. Right now, Monday morning. Um, this is the first thing I'm doing is recording this podcast. So I'm still still waking up a bit. But I, I, I originally recorded an episode last night. And just kind of like had my immediate reactions. And decided to sit on it before I... I uh, published it, but then I woke up and I was like, you know, my thoughts have kind of like, they've marinated overnight and I've had a chance to kind of like think about some stuff. So I'm just going to record a, a fresh, uh, somewhat fresh perspective on the show. So yeah, let's just jump right to it. So I'll start with the pre-show and work my way up to the main card. So um, but before the first match in the pre-show, some big news um, that Charlie Caruso, you know, one of the... Uh, the interview ladies for WWE um, announced that uh, Hulk Hogan has been reinstated back into the WWE. Yes, Hulk Hogan. You guys remember him, right? He uh, we used to wrestle for the company. He was uh, kind of a big deal. He he may have he may have you know wrestled a few WrestleMania matches. Uh, no big deal. Won a few championships. But uh, yeah, he he since uh, God when, when was that whole scandal? Um, if you're not familiar, he was exiled basically from the WWE after a like a sex tape or something from years and years ago uh, leaked where he uh, said some racist remarks about uh, I think it was like his daughter Brooke dating a black guy and he made some kind of racial remark about it and I think gawker published it or something but it led to that really big lawsuit between him and gawker which he won and which effectively kind of put gawker out of business i believe um but yeah uh since then since that incident he'd been like kind of suspended from the hall of fame and you've had no mention of him uh, for the last few years andre the giant uh slammed himself at wrestlemania 3 but yeah it was announced yesterday that he has been reinstated back in the Hall of Fame, and now, and they even said he was backstage at Extreme Rules, leading to some to believe that maybe, hey, he'll come out and make an appearance. He did not. But I heard, allegedly, that he issued a big apology to the locker room to, uh, before the show. Um, something like, well, let me tell you something, brothers. Oh, you heard about those racist remarks, man. And I'm sorry about, sorry about what I said about those black people, dude. Cause that's not, that's not the guy I am, but you know, you got the 24 inch pythons and when you're going and you're going in bed, brother, and you just get a little hyped up, you just get hyped up and you say some things that you didn't mean to say, dude, I'm sorry, but it's great to be back, Jack. Also, Randy Orton, I'm sorry about SummerSlam 2006, dude. We got to get a rematch in there, brother. We are going to go over. You're going to go over Big Jack 
and then maybe next time I win the next match, and then we'll have a rematch, and then uh, we'll talk about the winner of that one, brother. But yeah, big sorry, big sorry, brother. Hulk Hogan, in the house. Thank you for coming on this morning. Uh, sip of coffee real quick. Ah, delicious. So yeah, anyway, first match on the pre-show, we had Andrade Cien Almas, accompanied by Zelina Vega, versus Sin Cara. This was a uh, rematch from their uh, their first match on SmackDown, which Andrade won. Um, you know, same story, you know, Andrade and Cien were said to have known each other for years. Uh, Sin Cara is confused and upset that Andrade is now an asshole. And wants answers, and Andrade's like, screw you, dude, I've got Selena, Zelina Vega and success, so I don't need you anymore. So that's why they're fighting, in case you're not familiar with the story. Um, nice back and forth match, same thing with SmackDown on uh, Sin Cara. Got in a lot of offense, and got the show off again. Um, these two match well, which isn't surprising, but in the, uh, ooh, there was a cute spot actually where Zelina and Andrade did their, their rope pose, you know, when Andrade jumps in the ropes and fakes di fakes doing a suicide dive but then he just kind of clings there like a m spider monkey and just kind of smiles with that shit-eating grin of his and then Zelina posed on the apron underneath him and it was like it's like oh that's cute that's cute but yeah Andrade won after his hammer lock DDT to put Carl away and I hope the end of this feud and hopefully Andrade will move on to something a little bit more important uh next up we had a sanity versus the new day in one of like i mentioned before one of the few extreme stipulations on the on the card in a six man tag team table match now this was a traditional table match in that you only have to eliminate one member of the team by putting the like or you, you have to put one member of the team through a table to win the match it's not elimination um, and this was a fun, chaotic little match as it should have been. And as was expected, um, there was a cool spot where they did a tower, like a double tower of doom. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with a tower of doom, it's like a superplex, which is a vertical suplex out of the, the turnbuckle. But the, the third person gets involved where like, so the person delivering the suplex to the person perched on top of the turnbuckle, a third person gets underneath the person doing the suplex and tries to power bomb them. So then all three of them go down. But they did a tag team version where it's like a, the two two members of Sanity were trying to do a double superplex to Kofi. Biggie and Xavier interfere and get underneath the two members of Sanity and try to do a double powerbomb to them. But instead of doing a traditional Tower of Doom, Kofi instead jumps off the top and does a to, like a top rope double stomp to the two Sanity members as they're getting powerbombed down by... Xavier and Big E and that was cool and unique but it was all for naught because in the end Eric Young put Kofi through a table to give Sanity the win uh which is you know the right result in my opinion Sanity needed to win more New Day can bounce back uh they're somewhat bulletproof at this point so yeah that was a fun little match I'm just confused as to why that wasn't on the main card considering again there was a, a couple of matches on the main card I really should have swapped with this match oh anyway extreme rules proper kicked off and somewhat surprisingly the first match was the raw tag team championships it was the b team the very comedic team of bo dallas and curtis axel taking on the champions the deletas of worlds matt hardy or woken matt hardy to be exact and bray wyatt and this, I said this in my Raw review, this this feud has been incredibly one-note and one-sided. It's been literally every week the B-team doing parodies of the Deleters of World and then beating Matt Hardy in a single match. That's been the feud. Literally, that's been the entire feud. But it's disappointing, especially on the uh, Champions end, because you have a team as wacky and over-the-top as Hardy and Wyatt, and uh, they've done a grand total of nothing with those guys since they won the belts back at the greatest Royal Rumble. And their reign came to an end in a somewhat slight surprise. The B team beat them after a very unremarkable match. Um, I 
I think I mentioned this Monday, I would have bet that the Hardy and Wyatt would have retained and gone on to lose those titles at SummerSlam to the Revival, or maybe even the Authors of Pain, but I thought for sure the Revival would be the ones to take those away. Mm. Oh, excuse me, that was another coffee swig, uh, and uh, maybe I should pour one out for their title reign, which wound up being, again, like, just, just a reign. How do you not do anything crazy with Hardy and Wyatt as champions like not even let at least at least let Matt film some crazy vignettes of the two doing just weird crap at the Hardy compound just to um just to remind us that hey this is crazy that these two are together and also one of them is Woken Matt Hardy (laughs) who is probably the most insane character on the roster how do you not do anything with that so yeah it's kind of you know the B team one we'll see if they are uh if they get a chance to actually do anything interesting, they're, you know, they're, they're a funny team. Uh, Bo Dallas's first championship win on the main roster, which I didn't realize until after the fact. And then, you know, Curtis Axel's first championship since his intercontinental title reign in 2013. So uh, yeah, we'll see where they go, but they should be f- fun champions going forward. And who knows, maybe Hardy and Wyatt will get a fun rematch. Maybe a tag team apocalypto. If you're not familiar with Tag Team Apocalypto, you should look that up. It's a thing that uh, he did in TNA that was pretty damn insane and entertaining. Anyways, moving on, we had a backstage little thing with Kurt Angle talking about the whole Brock Lesnar situation and being being upset. He's, he's mad at Brock because, you know, the story is that he might not show up at SummerSlam to defend the Universal Championship. He's also just been, he's been holding up the company, threatening to just leave with the belt and then he appeared on ufc the last ufc pay-per-view recently and got into the face of one of the champions so he's like oh you know why is he doing that he's not gonna he's gonna show up there but he's not gonna show up on on raw well here's an ultimatum tomorrow night on raw which would be tonight he is he better show up or if he doesn't show up i'm just gonna strip the title of him and when he said that he was going to strip the title that got the biggest pop of the night because I think most people, like myself, are tired of not having a permanent world champion on Raw. It's been a year, and it's been about 15 months since he won it, however long his reign has been. I think he's defended it a grand total of maybe six times in the last year plus. And, yeah, it's it's run its course. For me, at least. I'm, I, I would, as sick as I am of seeing Roman Reigns fight Brock Lesnar, I would, if it means getting the belt... Back on Raw full time, I am on board with Roman taking it away because I just want something to take that. Like, I'm fine with just putting a giant magnet in Saskatchewan at his ranch or wherever he lives and just having that thing, having that magnet just uh, suck the belt off of his waist and then the magnet comes back to, you know, Stanford, Connecticut, get it back on Raw, whatever you got to do to get that thing off of him. Please, it's, it's, it's enough. I'm tired of it. It's really hurting Raw, not having a world champion around all the time. Anyways, next match we had Constable Baron Corbin versus Finn Balor. And the story of this feud was nothing really special. Basically, Corbin throwing his weight around as the Constable and making fun of Balor for being small. And Balor just taking exception to it. That's pretty much the extent of the feud. This was a normal match as was Hardy and Wyatt. And this was one of the matches I was talking about before that really should have switched with the New Day Sanity Tables match because this match not only didn't have, like, that big of a story, but it's also a... It was a normal match, and it was probably the least um, interesting match on the entire card. And, you know, uh, the match itself was fine, nothing special. Uh, Balor won with a small package. He's been studying those... uh, Paul Smackage Tapes, if you're a fan of the Edge and Christian podcast. It's a great podcast. It's almost as good as this one. And, um, yeah, that's it. Balor wins. Um, Normally this would mean, hey, maybe he can challenge for the Universal Championship. But, like I said before, there's no Universal title. Which is, I think Balor is one of the biggest victims of not having a world title around. Because he has been floating around doing next to nothing. Because he has nothing to chase. And I'm not saying that he needs to win it. But he just needs some something... To give him direction and because he is one of many main event stars that are just kind of waiting for Brock to show up he's been moving from random feud to random not even feud sometimes just random matches until you know Brock decides to uh to grace us with his uh his very large and very intimidating presence 
Uh, next up, we got Team Hell No. They're backstage, and we see them getting jumped, getting mugged by the Bludgeon Brothers, and just beating them up to try to give the Bludgeon Brothers, you know, trying to get an advantage in their tag team title match later in the night. Kane got his foot smashed between a door, and it was a big question of, will Team Hell No be able to compete? And my immediate thought was, they wouldn't, like, they wouldn't take one of them away out of the match, would they? Like, literally, I was, this, on the SmackDown side of things, this was arguably the SmackDown main event, even more so than the WWE Championship, just because this, the, the big deal that they've been making of Team Hell No getting back together and even putting them on the poster for the show, like the poster for Extreme Rules, is Team Hell No. <laughs> so they're like, they wouldn't, like, shortchange this match that has kind of been the focal point of SmackDown, will they? Um, so that was like, mm, okay. But um, we'll, we'll get to that later. But next up after that, we had arguably the most infuriating match of the night between Asuka and SmackDown Women's Champion Carmella and with SmackDown defending her or with SmackDown defending with Carmella defending her SmackDown Women's Championship. I have to drink a little bit more coffee to wake up so I'm going to keep saying stupid stuff. So, hold on. Mm. Ah, there we go. Okay, Carmella defending the SmackDown Women's Championship against Asuka. With the stipulation being that James Ellsworth, Carmella's stooge, who has been, you know, helping her win and, and cost Asuka her last championship match to step inside of a shark cage and be suspended above the ring to uh, nullify his interference. Uh, like I said in my SmackDown review this past week, WWE has fallen very much in, back in love with the shark cage concept the last couple of years. Um, it's... I'm getting a little tired of it personally. It's not really a great gimmick. It it, it never really works, but um, it's because there's a lot of holes in it. Um, what you see in this match, where like immediately, um, James starts throwing weapons that he had on him, which begs the question of why didn't they search him before they put him into the the cage? Like he tries to throw Carmella a chain, it doesn't work. He then tries to throw Carmella some some more arrogance, some arrogance spray. He uh talked to Rick Martell backstage and said, hey, let me get some of that. Um, that also did not work. And yeah, this whole feud, I, so I I like Carmella. Carmella's gotten a lot better, and it's crazy to think that out of the trio of her, Big Cass, and Enzo Amore, that she is not only the only one that's left in the company, but has by far been the most successful. <laughs> Who would have ever thought that, that back in the NXT days when she was the weakest link of the team by far? So good for her, but she, despite the fact that she has improved as a wrestler, she still isn't amazing. She, seeing her, seeing Carmella matched up against Asuka, even though wrestling is all about suspending disbelief, of course, and I can do that, been doing it for over two decades, I have a hard time buying Carmella being any sort of physical threat to Asuka, because Asuka is just a machine, and so... This was a lot of Asuka basically slipping on banana peels to give Carmella the victory. And I mean, when I say that, I mean that uh, eventually, very soon, this was not a long match. Ellsworth lockpicked the shark cage to escape. He's He's been playing a lot of Elder Scrolls and got his lockpicking skills up. But then as soon as he opens the door, he tries to climb out and he gets his ankle caught on the corner. So he's dangling from the cage. Granted, the cage was not very high. I think it was maybe like eight feet off the ground. So... Him dangling there, he was basically almost touching the mat. But he was vulnerable, and then Asuka decides that would be a great time to stop attacking Carmella and to just start kicking the crap out of him while he's dangling there, which allowed Carmella to sneak up from behind and shove Asuka headfirst into the cage to get the one, two, three. And I am, I, man, this, you know, I get the idea of this victory in terms of it's, it's a cheap victory to get Carmella, you know, hated. She's more or less... Um, the Honky Tonk Man style champion, which if you're not familiar with the Honky Tonk Man, well, back in the 80s, he was the Intercontinental Champion for over a year or a year. Um, but he he was a uh, terrible. He was a he was a chicken shit heel. He was not a great wrestler. That 
he wasn't supposed to be. The idea was that he was this Elvis impersonator who just got on the crowd's nerves because he would come out and play these songs, and he was far inferior than all the challengers, but he managed to hold on to the Intercontinental title by just utilizing every cheap trick in the book, either by cheating or walking out of his matches, but just, you know, he would always wrestle guys that on paper should annihilate him, but he always found some sort of way to win, and it drove the crowd insane but it also drew a lot of money because every time he defended that belt everyone wanted to see it get taken away from him and then eventually did with ultimate warrior squatching him in like seconds and probably one of the most famous um intercontinental championship matches ever and carmella is kind of in that vein of champions of like someone who's clearly not uh not in not imposing or like a threat physically but finds every trick in the book to beat people who on paper should annihilate her she's already done it with charlotte who's in my opinion probably the best women's wrestler of this generation and then the same with oscar who is also a, a, just an absolute killing machine in her own right and you know it's uh like carmela's charismatic as hell and she's a great character just it just Seeing Asuka lose like this after being undefeated for this long is just annoying. And she has kind of fallen through the floor since losing to Charlotte at WrestleMania. Like, she is, she has somehow become a choke artist in these big matches, which I never thought I would say about Asuka, of all people. So, yeah, and the crowd didn't seem very jazzed about this this uh, ending as either. So, Carmella, still your SmackDown Women's Champion. Um, hopefully, Becky Lynch will get the next shot at i guess i presume SummerSlam because people have really been want becky the becky has been in a big of a role lately so that seems to be the next logical move speaking of matches that were weird um the united states championship match between shinsuke nakamura and the defending champion jeff hardy um this was a bad night to be a hardy boy because jeff so Jeff comes out, I can just describe the whole match because this match was extremely short. So Jeff comes out second, as you would, because he's the champion, and as soon as they're in the ring together, this is before the bell rings, Jeff turns around, and Nakamura immediately low blows him. Just that that stiff uppercut to Jeff's hardy boys, his, the two hard, his little hardy boys between his legs, hit those and drop them. And then, you know, he's as Jeff is on the ground in pain, I guess the bell rings. I, I think the, the ref checks with Jeff, and Jeff's like, I'm ready. And b before Jeff is completely um, recovered, Nakamura hits an immediate Kinshasa and then pins him and wins the championship in about, um, I, I don't even think 30 seconds, because, I you know, the match didn't actually start till the bell rang. So, like, him writhing on the pen, on the ground from the low blow lasted longer than the actual needed a face and pin so immediately nakamura won the belt which was it, it was insane and no one expected it so it got the initial like what what pop but then it, i i was kind of like oh because i this was one of the matches i was genuinely looking forward to seeing uh we were supposed to get it uh, a few weeks ago but then nakamura was I kid you not, backstage, and this is a true story, he uh, uh, was attacked by a police dog. Like, a police dog that was backstage randomly bit his leg for no reason. And he, he they had to postpone the match while he was recovering from that. And honestly, his match against a German Shepherd or whatever it was probably lasted longer than his match against the United States champion. <laughs> so yeah, Shinsuke Nakamura is our new United States champion. But after the match, Randy Orton made his return. He's been... Uh, He's been out of action for the last two months. I don't think he was hurt or anything. I think he's just, you know, just taking a break. And he comes out to the ring. And Shinsuke uh, bails. He doesn't leave, though. I mean, he gets out of the ring, but he just kind of stands on top of the announce table while Randy gets in the ring. And Jeff is still on the ground just trying to remember what planet he's on. And in a surprising, somewhat surprising move, um, Orton attacks Jeff, but not with an RKO. He... Just, like, he stomps on his, his balls. He stomps on his balls. Like, you know, he opens his legs and just literally just stomps on his balls. That's all he does. And which is a very heel maneuver. And I know that Randy Orton is at the point in his career um, where he can kind of do whatever he wants. And the crowd will generally be kind of okay with it. Um, 
mainly because his character has always been kind of a tweener when he's a baby face he can like he can do douche things and still get cheered for it because they're like it's more like oh that's just randy being randy and not ah what an asshole but this felt more like a heel term because it wasn't like an rko out of nowhere where everyone would be like ah that's, that's randy classic randy whereas like he 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 literally kicked the guy who was already down viciously with a low blow which is the, the, the that is the ultimate heel move is a low blow and a, a stomp no less so that was a surprise so i i'm taking that as a heel turn because he also didn't do anything to nakamura he just kind of like stared nakamura down and then left so i can only assume he wants back in the u.s title picture um I, I, I'm, I, I'm not personally super jazzed about seeing a triple threat just because I would like to see Hardy and Nakamura have their singles match. And granted, they did have one singles match uh, weeks prior to this that kicked this whole feud off. So it's not like they've never wrestled before, but that was a, a nothing match. Like I wanted now that we have a match with an actual like feud behind it. I wanted to see them go at it. So I'd rather see those two go at it first before you throw Randy in there. And I don't know if Jeff was hurt or anything, and that's why it was so match, or if that, or if that's why the match was so short, or if that's just what the plan was to begin with. But yeah, it was, uh, uh, like I said, bad night to be a Hardy. Somehow Jeff, despite having two pairs of eyeballs, his painted eyes and his normal eyes, he didn't see Nakamura or Orton coming at him. So... Like I said, rough night to be in the Hardy family. Uh, next up we had, let's see, uh, Braun Strowman versus Kevin Owens in a steel cage match. If you don't know the story of this feud, basically at some point, um, Braun Strowman decided, hey, I'm going to just pick on Kevin Owens for no real reason um, by, you know, this kind of, I guess this technically started at Money in the Bank. Or, uh, you know, Braun threw, during the match, he threw Ro Roman. He threw KO off of a ladder through a table, which is fine, because that's part of the match, and that's just what happens. But then after that night, uh, KO proposed working together with Braun in his kind of smarmy way, but nothing crazy. And then Braun took exceptions to that and has spent the last few weeks just tormenting him. Like, he, he flipped his rental car over... He locked him in the porta potty and dragged it on stage and like pushed it off and you know injured him. Uh, he's he's just beating him up, and it's crazy because watching the video package um, summing up this entire story, I was waiting for the part where Owens shot Braun's dog and then burned Braun's house down to basically basically I'm I'm looking for the reason as to why Kevin deserves all of this abuse. And that has been the big thing crippling the story because Braun has been presented as the good guy and KO as the bad guy, but Braun has been the complete aggressor and bully in this, whereas Ke Kevin has been literally just running away, saying he doesn't want to fight Braun, trying to get out of it. And I guess it's cowardly, but again, he hasn't he hasn't done anything to Strowman for Strowman to be on him the way that he has been. And so this made for an awkward match from a pure, just kind of like dynamic face, baby face, heel component. Um, you know, uh, it was Kevin getting thrown around a lot into the cage. Uh, again, this felt like this should have been Kevin getting his comeuppance after trying to escape Strowman for weeks for the terrible thing that he did. And we're supposed to be like, yeah, now Braun's finally getting his hands on him. But since we don't have that reason, it was just him getting destroyed. For no real emotional, you know, reaction or reasoning. Um, at one point, Kevin handcuffs Braun to the cage. But because WWE and Kevin Owens, I guess, are idiots. Uh, instead of just immediately climbing out of the cage and winning the match. Which would fit the story because Kevin has not... He's been trying to get out of this match since it was announced. He just taunts Braun. And then proceeds to get one arm chokeslammed by him while he's handcuffed in the corner. Um... Then after that, Kevin wakes up and is like, hey, I should just leave. And he starts climbing. But again, he gets like halfway up and he stops to taunt Braun, which allows Braun to rip the handcuffs off because he's super strong. And then climb up, catch Kevin before he can escape. He drags Kevin to the top of the cage 
And then in kind of the big spot of the night, he throws Kevin off the top of the cage through the announce table in a very nasty looking landing. It kind of, the way he fell kind of reminded me of how Mick Foley fell off the Hell in a Cell at King of the Ring 98 and very famous match with The Undertaker. Um, he hit that thing hard. He, it looked great. But again, it, it it had the only satisfaction was, oh, wow, that looked cool. And not like, huh, that's what you get KO for that thing that you did. It was just like, oh, man, you kind of feel bad. But this also allowed Kevin to win the match because, you know, he, he escaped. Technically, he, hit, he touched the floor first. So, again, how is Braun the, the good guy in all of this? So he basically decided that injuring Kevin was more important than winning the match because Braun has never been perceived to be like an idiot. You know, he's a big, strong kind of monstery dude, but he's also not dumb. So like he, he would have had to known that that would have him win the match. So in my mind, he was like, you know what? I think possibly crippling Kevin is more important than winning the match. And again, that's not very babyface behavior because WWE is terrible at booking baby faces. <laughs> um, or at least has been for in recent years, I guess. Uh, so yeah, you know, Kevin does the, the big stretcher job. And then, you know, everyone were kind of expected to be like, yeah, Braun, you did it. Woo, even though you technically you didn't do it, you lost the match, but you hurt another man who didn't actually do anything to you. So uh, weird match. It wasn't great it just this the whole match was just crippled by how just bizarre the storytelling was in it hmm let's see we had uh the next match we had our smackdown tag team championship match between team hell no kane and daniel bryan taking on the champions the bludgeon brothers luke harper and eric rowan and to to for the first half of this match um, Daniel Bryan came out by himself because Kane had not yet recovered from the backstage assault. So we had a handicap match for the first half, which felt like the tag team match at WrestleMania between Bryan and Shane and Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn were, you know, Bryan was the main attraction and then he got jumped right at the beginning of the match and was out of the match for like the first half. And, you know, he kind of felt kind of, kind of slighted of like, Hey, this is what we wanted or was advertised, and then you give us, like, half of that, basically. But this was kind of worse, because Kane eventually showed up, but he was in a cast, which, unless I'm forgetting something, I don't think I've ever seen Kane in his 20-plus years in the company in a cast or, like, a sling or anything, anything like that. Like... I think there was one time he had his arm wrapped up from some kind of attack, but at most that's been it, so that I can remember. So seeing him in a, a an actual like boot, like he was in a foot foot boot or whatever you call those, limping to the ring, it just looked it looked wrong, because you know Kane is supposed to be this monster from hell. He's the devil's favorite demon. He's the big red machine, and he's coming out in like a medical boot, limping to the rain. It just looked really weird to me, and of course he could barely do anything in the match. He was not even really in it. I think he tagged in once, basically got beat up. Brian came back in and then got beat by the Bludgeon Brothers. So the Bludgeon Brothers retain, and that, and I guess all I can say is thank God that Team Hell No technically reunited in the tag match on SmackDown, because if this was their first match back together, that would be a huge letdown, because once again, they were kind of billed as the SmackDown main event, and are on the poster. So, yeah, and with the Bludgeon Brothers victory, they kind of continued the streak of douchebags winning matches, because with the exception of Finn Balor, it's been all villains winning, plus Braun Strowman, who was really the villain in his storyline. <laughs> so... Yeah, good night to be an asshole. Next up we had, and a big surprise, Roman Reigns versus Bobby Lashley. And the first thing I thought as soon as that video package was playing was, holy crap, this is not the main event. They learned their lesson. They're not main eventing the show. I would have I would have bet anything that they were going to close the show with this because it's raw. It's a raw match. It's a Roman Reigns match. And the WWE Championship, for whatever reason... Maybe because it's on SmackDown, it's not worthy of closing pay-per-views anymore. Because when was the last time that title is actually main event in a pay-per-view? 
Um, so I, I like I, I think I said Monday that I was convinced that, yeah, Reigns versus Lashley going to close the show because this company doesn't learn. And I guess they sort of learned their lesson because this didn't close it. Um, and this match, again, was a normal match. Uh, it was a good match. It was a nice, hard-hitting match. Um, Lashley got to show off his amateur wrestling background, which is something that, um, even though the announcers kind of talk about it semi-regularly, it's not something you often get to see him do because he's usually the bigger guy in his matches, or at least he has been since he came back. So he hasn't had a reason to do any mat wrestling. He just can, you know, outpower them and do power moves. So putting up against someone who's like the same size of him in Roman Reigns, we got to see him do his amateur stuff, which was, you know, a nice reminder that he can do that stuff and he's good at it. So we got to see, uh, some good chain wrestling from, from Bobby doing some like, you know, amateur, you know, slams and, you know, belly to belly, all that stuff. Um, at one point in the match that was really stupid. Roman tries to hit Bobby Lashley with the steel stairs on purpose, which I was like, did Roman forget that despite the fact that this is an extreme rules pay-per-view that he's in a normal match and that, you know, he forgot the rules and that there are rules in his match. So, like, hitting Bobby with the stairs would DQ Roman and, and give him a loss. Um, you know, Bobby blocked the stairs. Of course, that did not happen. But just the idea of, like, is, is Roman an idiot? <laughs> um, there's also another point where uh, he throws Bobby over the top rope down to the ring. Like, he basically does not a John Cena AA to Bobby outside of the ring and, and Bobby hit the ground in a really sick kind of thud and it looked really good but it also looked extremely painful the way he landed but you know thankfully Bobby was okay and in a big surprise uh Lashley won and not only did he win but he won with a spear he speared Roman Reigns and beat him clean one two three and this was after Roman was talking a lot of trash to to Bobby about you know it, it's my yard. I'm the big dog. I'm a cock my fist like a shotgun. And I was happy to see that because Lashley needed the win, especially after that terrible Sami Zayn feud. And also, if it means that he gets to face Brock for the title, I'm okay with that for the sake of variety because I'm, I'm I do not need to see Reigns versus Lashley four or whatever number they're up to at this point and also from a storytelling standpoint it was nice to see roman who has been i mean it this match was basically a good guy versus a good guy but reigns has easily been the douchebag in this feud as he often is because he just comes off as a dick and he definitely turned it up for this feud so to kind of see him get what he deserved was it's always satisfying to see so uh We'll see if uh, if this leads to anything, especially tomorrow night with Brock on Raw, if Lashley can parlay this victory into a Universal Championship match, provided that Braun Strowman doesn't cash in his money in the bank as soon as Braun steps into the arena, which could, or as soon as Brock steps into the arena, which I, I very much could see happening, and it would make sense, because why wouldn't Braun cash in on Brock if he's going to be there? So, our next match was the only Extreme Rules match in the card, the only actual extreme rules match between Nia Jax versus Alexa Bliss for the Raw Women's Championship. Alexa was defending and the story of this match was, you know, this was a rematch from Alexa taking the title away from Nia at Extreme Rules last month when Nia Jax was defending against Ronda Rousey and then Alexa who had won the Women's Money in the Bank match cashing in in the middle of the match and winning the t and, you know, st stealing the title away from both of them. And the caveat with this match was that Ronda Rousey had a front row ticket to watch this match because, you know, she had been suspended for 30 days following her beating the absolute crap out of Alexa the night after Money in the Bank for what she did. And so Kurt Angle suspended her. So she's like, all right, well, I'm going to kick her ass sooner or later. So I'm going to buy a front row ticket to this match. Just this kind of psych her out. So she was there with her husband, who I, I believe Ronda's husband is also an MMA fighter, like a famous MMA fighter. But he was there too. And the match itself was, it was fine. It was nice to see Nia destroying Alexa a bit, the way she pretty much always should. Because Nia's huge and Alexa is, is less huge, significantly less huge. Um, there was kind of a silly point where um, 
Nikki James, who was out there, was tossing Alexa weapons to use against Nia. And every time she went to, to swing, Nia would just take the weapon away and throw it in the ring. And this went on for a good while where, like, Nikki would be, Nikki's under the ring. She tosses Alexa a chair. Alexa goes to swing the chair. Nia's like, nope. But instead of hitting Alexa with the chair, she just throws it in the ring. And she did that with, like, five different weapons. Like, here's the garbage can. Nope, take that away, throw it in the ring. All right, here's the Kindle stick. Nope, take that away, throw it in the ring. It's like, just hit Alexa with it. Why are you throwing all this in the ring? So that was kind of dumb. But, you know, uh, Natalia was also out there to in the corner of Naya to try to counteract Mickey. Um, and then at one point, Mickey and Alexa started beating up Natalia, who was also Ronda Rousey's friend. And that prompted Ronda to jump the barricade because WWE security is awful and sprint and proceed to beat the living crap out of Mickey James, which anytime Ronda Rousey gets to just slaughter someone it makes my soul smile. It just makes me so happy because she's so darn entertaining when she is just beheading people and just eviscerating them. And this was no different. So, and the crowd reacted you know, to this more than anything else in the match. We're just seeing Ronda in her element. And, you know, eventually, though, Alexa and Mickey got the better of Ronda with the numbers game. And then they they started beating her down with a kendo stick right in front of Ronda's husband. And to me, you know, obviously, I know it's wrestling. And I know, again, suspension of disbelief. But she, her husband is standing right over her wife, his wife. Literally, she's down right in front of him. And she's getting worn, worn down with this kendo stick. And he just kind of casually watches. And that kind of took me out of it for a bit because it's like, okay, you guys couldn't, like, if you're planning to do this, and I don't know if they meant to do it right in front of her husband or if it's just kind of coincidence, but, like, if you're going to do it there, at least get her husband in on the act and that have him look concerned or upset or have him, like, even just have him jump the barricade and have him get in between Rhonda and you know, the, the, the Alexa and Mickey, because, you know, maybe you make the argument of like, oh, well, that would look Ronda look really weak because her man has to save her. And it's like, but realistically, it's, first of all, it's not making her look weak because she's getting double teamed by two people. And I know it's Ronda Rousey, but it's still Ronda Rousey against two people. And both of them are multi-time women's champions. And one of them has a weapon. So, you know, you can buy that. But like, what husband is going to sit by and watch his wife, even if she is Wonder Woman, get annihilated? in front of them with a weapon like I'm not, he doesn't have to beat up alexa or anything he just has to like hop in and be like hey you know that's enough leave her alone like maybe they could even i mean this might maybe this will be pushing it too far but like maybe you have alexa take a shot at him just to really get some heat so yeah it just looked weird to just have him sit there and just kind of like just watching his wife get beat down just be like huh eh, you know that, that happens i guess so just for the sake of realism i would have liked that but Alexa won the match after hitting a DDT to Nia on the chair. So that should be the end of that story, which uh, should lead us to Alexa versus Ronda at SummerSlam, which should be an entertaining match because Alexa is an amazing heel and is great and making you want to see her get destroyed. And there ain't no one on that woman's roster except for Asuka that's better at dealing out destruction than Ronda Rousey. So... That should be a fun match. Next up, we had the WWE Championship match with champion AJ Styles defending against Rusev. And on Rusev Day, no less. Also, happy Rusev Day to everyone listening. Um, uh, once again, WWE Championship for the umpteenth pay-per-view in a row. Um, does not get to close the show. Uh, yeah, you know... It's, uh, I don't know why that's a thing suddenly. I mean, I have an idea why, because it's a SmackDown match, and even though it's, despite what WWE would like you to believe, SmackDown to them is perceived as the B-Show. So even though the WWE Championship is the most prestigious prize in the company, and it's the only world title that's around full-time, and it's around the waist of the best performer in the company, it's not good enough to main event any kind of Raw match, or over any kind of Raw match. So, yeah, uh, other than that, uh, this was a good match. I really don't have much to say about it. Uh, it was just a great, really good back-and-forth match. Rusev looked really good. Um, there was some nice psychology where AJ was working on his legs, 
And then when Rusev went to lock in the accolade, he couldn't because he couldn't sit on the leg that AJ worked on, which um, kind of led to AJ uh, picking up the win. So, you know, it told a logical story. Rusev looked good in defeat. He didn't need to win the title. I didn't think he would anyway. Um, he was great in the role of kind of being the uh, kind of the monster of the month. And he got, or at least I think that he did, I think he got a lot out of this match to where now he looks like he can be a um, a world title contender or a world champion. Especially, I mean, why not? Jinder Mahal was a world champion and he is, he has like infinitely less charisma, uh, athletic ability and accomplishment that Rusev has. Not to mention the crowd reaction. So if he can do it, there's literally no reason why Rusev can't be uh, WWE champion one day. So great showing for Rusev. Another good performance from Styles. I look forward to seeing him hopefully defended against Samoa Joe at SummerSlam. And this brings us to our main event of the evening. The Iron Man match. The 30-minute Iron Man match for the Intercontinental Championship between Seth Rollins and against the champion Dolph Ziggler who had Drew McIntyre in his corner and I don't know if the commentary team mentioned this I didn't hear them mention it unless I missed it but this was the first time that the Intercontinental Championship has main evented a pay-per-view since I believe SummerSlam 1992 and that now the legendary match between Bret Hart and the British Bulldog at Wembley Stadium in London and I, I think that was the last time that that's happened. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not going to look it up because this is calling in the ring. And as the name suggests, I just, I'm, I make it up as I go. I'm, I'm calling it in the ring. I'm just, I'm calling on the fly. So, but to my knowledge, I'm almost confident that that's the last time that that's happened. And I don't think that was brought up, which is insane because that's a big deal. And again, uh, this closing the show, I get the idea behind it and that, it's a one it's it, it you know it's you should probably try to close a show called extreme rules on some sort of gimmick match um and it's cool to see the intercontinental title main event a show it's just that the story did not warrant it closing over the wwe championship it really didn't um so it, it's kind of like a mixed bittersweetness in terms of the position of this match um but you know, Rollins has been on a roll like a few others other than AJ Styles. And Dolph Ziggler is Dolph Ziggler. Again, I, I've mentioned my feelings on Dolph and Raw. Like, I, Dolph Ziggler is a very good wrestler. I just cannot find my... I cannot make myself care about anything that he does because he's had so many start and stop pushes over the years that anything he does, I just can't get invested in it because I, I know it's not going to go anywhere. So, I just... I find myself just not caring about him. And I'm a little... I'm kind of resentful of him because... He's, to me, is holding back Drew McIntyre, who is an amazing talent and should be in that world title picture. Again, if we had a world title on Raw to to go after, but he's kind of stuck babysitting Dolph. So that's annoying to me. But um, this match overall was really good. Um, It had a kind of a little bit of a screwy first few minutes because uh, Seth went two pinfalls uh, to Dolph Zero within the first few minutes and then drew gets involved like he interferes in the match and he starts attacking seth which is stupid because that gave seth a dq victory which made him go three and oh and i was like did drew was are they are we to believe that drew's stupid enough to do that like why wouldn't he just attack dolph like why not just say they had a plan of like oh if seth if seth starts winning just hit me because then i'll get a dq win like he could have just stomped on dolph or something like why would he be dumb enough to attack Seth and you know the idea is that he you know he beat the crap out of Seth hit the claymore he got ejected from the match by the referee which then allowed Dolph to get three straight victories and tie it up within like two minutes or it was a very short amount of time and the announcers were playing it off as like it was worth it it was worth it for what Drew did because now he's hurt Seth and it's like I guess but it also just again you could have just hit Dolph and gotten a win instead of you know that that's such a big risk and it seems stupid for him to do that. Uh, it's also silly to score. I think there was a total of seven falls scored within like 
the first half of the match, like b- before you hit the halfway at 15 minutes. And it, you know, having that many pinfalls that quickly, it, it kind of interrupts the flow of the match because, you know, once you kind of get something going, somebody gets pinned and, you know, they have to recover and you kind of have to reset things a bit. So that, that, that kind of messed up the flow in the early going. But, you know, once they kind of got past the whole, like, rapid fire pinfalls and could just wrestle a match, it got much, much better. The only thing that killed this match had nothing to do with the wrestlers and had everything to do with the crowd in Pittsburgh who started acting like idiots because for some reason they got in their mind to count down the the clock so you know they have the clock on screen you know counting down to 30 minutes so you know how much time is left and every time it got to like the last 10 seconds of a minute so it'd be like you know 29 minutes 10 seconds and once it's counting down to 28 minutes they started doing the raw rumble countdown so you know they would do the you know 5 4 Three, two, one, burn! Like they did the buzzer sound, and they thought that was so clever and hilarious that they literally did it for I think almost every minute of the match. And oftentimes they got they wouldn't even wait for like the final ten seconds to start doing it. It got to a point where like halfway they just kind of started doing it in the middle, and it was so distracting because they weren't reacting to anything in the match they were just doing that and further proof of that is that at one point because you know the clock isn't always on the screen it would disappear and then reappear when the kind of when it got close to the next minute so like at one point the clock vanished and then came back and the crowd like popped like crazy to the point where i and there was nothing in the match i was like okay like i think it was during a rest hold or something but like i was like why is the crowd suddenly like popping huge and i thought it was a beach ball or something at first but no it was the clock like so they were more interested in the clock than these two guys having a really good match for the intercontinental championship which is the title that a lot of fans used to complain like oh the wwe doesn't you know show respect to it and they don't they don't feature it as much as it used to be and then now that wwe is doing it they're like nah we think we'd rather focus on the clock and also you know seth rollins and dolph ziggler two guys that like everyone loves seth and dolph's a guy like man they don't give Dolph Ziggler a chance. They need to give him a chance. And now he's main eventing a pay-per-view as the champion. And again, you guys are like, nah, we'll just walk. We, we, we want the clock. We, we want the clock to win. The clock's our man. We think the Iron Man clock should challenge Brock for the Universal Championship. Maybe it will. Maybe events will misinterpret this reaction as, well, clearly the those two guys aren't over the way I thought they were. This is sounding more like Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan did not say that. It's all right. Let me get more Vince McMahon. Okay. Damn it. Okay, that's more. That, let me try. Damn it! They're not getting them over. We gotta put the belt on the clock. Damn it! You're fire. There it is. That's Vince. That's it's closer to Vince and not just an angrier Hulk Hogan. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, anyway, the crowd was dumb, and um, so this match ended on a draw. It it it. They both had four pinfalls apiece, which, you know, Dolph, they announced Dolph is the winner because when there's a draw, the champion wins until Kurt Angle came out and said, no way, Jose. And then no way, Jose came out. No, he didn't come out. But he said, we're restarting the match. Sudden death, a la WrestleMania 12. And, you know, but then immediately after restarting the match, Drew McIntyre comes back out. I don't know where he came from because he literally just appeared. I think he opened a portal or something and, you know, offered a quick distraction, allowing Dolph to hit the zigzag to Seth and pin him for the winning pin. And I didn't like that. I mean, I don't mind the the interference. I just wish it wasn't so quick. Like, it, what it should have been to me was that, you know, they, they announced sudden death. And then the match at least goes about two more minutes to just build drama of like, oh, who's going to win? Who's going to who's gonna get the last fall? And then do the the McIntyre interference? Because literally it was like, bell rings, here's Drew, zigzag, win. So it's like, oh, wow, the match is over. So like, what was the point of even doing sudden death? If you're going to do it that quick, why not have Drew interfere at the end of the original match and then just have, you know, Dolph win five to four within the, the 30 minutes if you're going to 
do sudden death that quickly. So that was weird to me. But other than that, this was a really good match. Um, damaged by a very, very just, you know, just immature crowd. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to harp. I, I don't mean to harp on the, the crowd too much, but it really, it really hurt this match with the way they were reacting. And I wonder if Rollins had flashbacks back to SummerSlam 2016 when he, uh, when he wrestled Finn Balor for the Universal Championship and the audience in Brooklyn were more concerned about crapping on the Universal title and how bad it looked than focusing on the really good match that he and Finn put on that night. So it was a similar situation. It's a, actually worse because this at least the at least the stuff in Brooklyn died down like eventually they started reacting to Finn and Seth whereas the rumble countdown thing never went away it was there from towards the beginning of the match to the very end so yeah um we'll see uh where Seth goes now uh, I hope like I said, I've said before, I hope that Seth is the next person to challenge Brock for the Universal Championship. I think he is the, the perfect opponent for him in terms of just the story you could tell of, like, he's the underdog. You know, he, the size difference. Him and Brock have a lot of history together, you know, from WrestleMania a few years ago. And they've had a singles match before. So, like, Seth could be trying to redeem himself because this was back when Seth was a heel and maybe he's like, I want to beat Brock the right way this time. And also, he's just on fire right now. Pardon the pun. But, like, people love him right now. And so, like, in terms of, if there's anyone that people are going to back to take that title from Brock, it's Seth right now. So, hopefully, this will be the first step towards that. Uh, other than that, um, Extreme Rules was a... Uh, so, this is weird. If this if this was not Extreme Rules and was any other pay-per-view, which it may as well have been because the Extreme Rules stipulation was not utilized to its fullest at all. Like, if this was Great American Bash, since this was in July, this would have been a better show because of the expectations would not have been there. But as an Extreme Rules show, it was pretty awful because there's nothing really extreme about it. Uh, the most extreme thing we saw was Owens falling off that cage. And I guess the token extreme rules match with the women but even that was tame at best so again if this was like battleground or payback this would be a better show uh, uh you know it's just the other problem was that the pacing was kind of all over the place there's just too many matches you know now that wb wants to do these four-hour shows and try to cram as many matches on both brands as possible you have a lot of matches like balor and corbin that don't really need to be on pay-per-view and then because you have so many matches that you have to get through, you you know, stuff like Nakamura and Hardy happens of like, oh, this was a 30 second match because we got to move on to the next thing. Uh, somehow that match, now that I think about it, that was a championship match that had more build, somehow got uh, less time, significantly less time than something as kind of throwaway as Finn Balor and Baron Corbin. So, yeah, like just, you know, qual the WWE has always been generally more quantity over quality which has been a big problem just scale back just you don't need that many matches on the show just get just put on about eight matches tops that are all well built and just give them time to breathe and just make for a better flowing show and put some damn stipulations on those matches so it feels like an extreme rules uh pay-per-view damn it because this this had to be the weakest extreme rules ever in terms of that so yeah but We'll see what happens in the aftermath on, on Raw tonight. We'll see what's going on with Brock Lesnar. If he's going to, you know, if he's actually going to defend the title or if Braun cashes in his briefcase tonight and takes it away from him. Uh, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens next. So, yeah. But anyways, thanks for listening, guys. I'll be back with a Monday Night Raw review tomorrow morning. And again, you know, like, share, subscribe, all of that, you know, obligatory YouTube podcast stuff. But, you know, I appreciate it if you do that. Uh, thanks. And I appreciate you listening to me rants about wrestling. So until next time, uh, check me out for Monday Night Raw again and for SmackDown this week. And until then, have a good one. Bye.